remember where magnification is an equal increase in the size of an object and the whole object is magnified. Other types of distortion, elongation and foreshortening are an unequal magnification. So increase in OID gives you an increase in magnification. Increase in OID of one end of an object is going to give you foreshortening. So whenever you have angled anatomy, what you're going to have is a very low OID with one end of the anatomy and an increase in OID with the opposite end of the anatomy. So with an angled anatomy, what you get is, is foreshortening as opposed to most of the time when you have elongation, what you're going to have is a central triangulation or a tilted image receptor. So now we've got not just an increase in OID, but we've got a part tube film misalignment. So again, elongation comes with central ray angulation, and it uh, can also come with a, a tilted image receptor whenever we have a tilted image receptor. And it occurs more with round anatomy again than with any other type of anatomy. So if you were to take a ball and put it on your image receptor and angle your central ray, instead of being a nice rounded shape, what you're going to see is, is an oval very quickly whenever you increase your, your angulation. Obviously, there's not going to be any foreshortening whenever you have a, a spherical shaped object, but whenever you have a elongated object already, like a long bone, and you angle that from the um, image receptor, or angle the image receptor itself, When you have a long type of anatomy, like a long bone, a femur, or a tib fib, or forearm, or something like that, when you angle the anatomy, what you're going to get is foreshortening. So what we have is normal anatomy. And it looks like we've actually got an increase in magnification on both ends of these. But... If we've got that much magnification on both ends of it, then this entire structure should be significantly longer. But what we've got really is an increase in thickness. So um, it, it looks to me like we've got an increase in magnification on this end of the image receptor when compared to the opposite end. And then on this one, what we've got is the, the appearance of the head of the humerus is very similar in the, the original versus this one. But we've got a very long appearing anatomy. So we've, we've got an increase in angulation uh, of the central ray, increase in angulation of the part. So we've got foreshortening and elongation. So the amount of di distortion depends on the thickness of the object. The immediate thing that you would think of think of the type of distortion you would consider in object thickness whenever you have an increase in object thickness is size distortion or magnification. But with an increase in OID, what you have is a increased likelihood that you could introduce some misalignment of the anatomy with the image receptor and therefore have some foreshortening as well. So object position is clearly going to be a foreshortening issue. <clears throat> An object shape can either be a size or shape distortion issue. So where it would be a, a size distortion issue is if you had a triangular anatomy, an anatomy that was thin on one end and thick on the other. All right, so... You see the way I'm drawing kind of a triangular shaped item. And the image receptor was, was represented by the, this uh, stamp down here at the bottom of the slide. So the fattest portion of the anatomy being at the bottom, you wouldn't really have any kind of magnification if it's in direct contact with the image receptor. But if the thin of end of the anatomy was closest to the image receptor and the fattest end was elevated, then you're going to have some magnification of the backside of this 
uh, structure. So uh, object, object shape can provide a, a shape or a size distortion. So uh, size distortion I just walked through. Shape distortion would be if you had a patient who was really, really hypersthenic and their femur was at an angle to the image receptor, um, their femur and their, their lower leg, and you were to be making an image of the patient's knee or the patient's hip, patient's femur, then you're going to run into some foreshortening there. I want to talk about focal spot. Remember, we've got two different things. The focal spot, the actual focal spot, is the actual area of bombardment. So it's going to be determined by two different things. You've got the filament size, which controls the stream of electrons, and you have to consider the focusing cup in there as well, but it, those two things control the stream of electrons, and therefore they control how wide of a stream of electrons we're going to have. But also, we've got an anode bevel. So the anode bevel generally runs from 15 to 17 degrees. So it's very vertical. It's up and down the, the face of the anode, and then you've got the bevel itself is at an angulation like so. So generally, the smaller the number, the more steep it is, and the smaller your focal spot's going to be. But remember, we've, this is the actual focal spot. We've also got what we call the projected focal spot. So actual focal spot is the actual area of bombardment. The, um, the projected focal spot or the effective focal spot would be what the patient would see if the patient was lying on the table and looking up at, at the anode. So patient's eyes here, and you got anode bevel here, and what it would look like is because the, the anode is at such a steep angulation, um, it would be kind of like holding your pen out in front of you with your pen being perpendicular to your line of sight. And if you tilt that pen until it's almost parallel with your line of sight, your, your pen looks very much smaller. So the patient's perception of what the focal spot would look like would be very, very small. So where 15 to 17 degrees is small, what the patient's line of sight would look like would be even smaller than that. So the difference between those two is what we call the line focus principle. And the line focus principle allows us to use that steep angulation on the anode to project a smaller focal spot off of a larger focal spot. And what that does for us is it gives us a larger area to deposit all those electrons so that the anode doesn't take all of those electrons in a single spot. It spreads the heat out some. That helps to extend the tube life. So what we're doing is we're using a relatively large actual focal spot. In a, with the angulation, we get a very small projected focal spot, so we increase sharpness for recorded detail while we're increasing the heat load capacity to extend the life of the x-ray tube. Remember that most of our x-ray tubes are dual focus, so we have a large focal spot and we have a small focal spot. So <coughs> changing the focal spot size has an effect on off-focus radiation. Off-focus radiation is radiation that's created outside of focus. So it's not on the focal track itself. So if we have electrons that speed across the tube and they slam into the target and they bounce off of the target because they're little bitty bundles, right? They're individual electrons. And if it bounces off of the target, it's still a negative charge. And the anode is positive charge. So it's still going to accelerate back towards the anode. And if it strikes anywhere that's not on the focal track itself, that's what we call off-focus radiation. Off-focus radiation just increases the, the effective and the actual size of the focal spot, and it reduces sharpness, sharpness for recorded detail. That's not the same thing as blooming. In blooming, what we have is the cathode gets too hot, and the electrons of the the size of the filament, the cathode itself, cannot contain 
all the electrons you're trying to pull off. So blooming comes at a very high exposure rate most of the time, or if you've got a long prep time. That's, it's important to note that with blooming, when we send the electrons across the tube, they're going to bloom, they're going to go out, instead of going directly towards the focus itself, they're going to stretch out just a little bit so that they don't strike on the focus itself, which technically you may be thinking, well, isn't that off focus radiation? And the answer is yes, it is. It's radiation that's created off of focal track. However, we're going to differentiate between those two. This occurs because you've just applied way too many electrons to the filament so they escape the, the effect of the focusing cup. And it's, it, it happens because of a specific reason. As opposed to off-focus radiation occurs in individual electrons. And it may be a whole lot of them, but it's individual electrons that bounce off of the focus and then uh, accelerate back towards the, the anode and create x-rays somewhere else. So both of them, yes, occur off of the focus and both increase the, the uh, effective and actual size of the focal spot, but how we get there are two totally different things. This is kind of like a ricochet, and this is just because you've got way too many electrons. So in both of those cases, we don't really have any effect on density or contrast. Uh, what we do see is additional blur on the anode heel effect or increase effect of the anode heel effect. And the anode heel effect is worse with steeper angles. Uh, the more vertical the angle, the smaller the number, the uh, worse the anode heel effect is. So we're going to look at a few different references in the textbook. The first one is on page 115. And on 115, what you see is a diagram. Uh, figure 6-24. The heel effect, the density differences of the heel effect, the selection of focal spot size has nothing, nothing to do with the heel effect, but the heel effect itself is caused by, <coughs> excuse me, the, the absorption characteristics of the anode itself. So because the angulation of, of the anode and the X-ray photons trying to penetrate through the anode. If you look at the expanded circle within that, that diagram, you see that some of those X-ray photons are trying to penetrate through the anode itself. That causes absorption inside of the anode because it's tungsten and it's hard to penetrate through. So what you wind up with is a difference in intensity between the cathode and the anode into the X-ray tube. So if what's coming straight down through the center of the port represents 100% of the intensity that we want, then what you see on the cathode end of the x-ray tube is less absorption. So it approaches 115% as opposed to on the anode end of the x-ray tube, it's down to about 80% of what's in the center of that central ray. So what we see there then is that we get an increase in intensity on the cathode end of the x-ray tube and a decrease in intensity on the anode end of the x-ray tube. That's the cause for that density difference. And it's not because of the cause of the, the focal spot size you selected. If you flip over to page 116, you'll see the kind of a diagram in figure 6-23 of what off-focus radiation actually is. And then if you go back over to page 114, you'll see the, the differences in two different focal spot sizes caused by the angulation of the anode. So if we have a more vertical anode, then we're going to have a change in the anode heel effect. But again, that has nothing to do with your selection of filament size that it has to do with the angulation of the tube. So the only time that you're going to have an increase or decrease in anode heel effect between filament sizes is if you have what they call a bi-angle tube. 
That's what you're looking at on figure 6-18 is an x-ray tube that has two different angulations. Probably has two different filaments too. So you've got a lot of things compounding the issue there. And in that case, you can have a difference in anode heel effect by the selection of the filament size. But that's a unique situation. Finally, if we switch over to page 177, figure 10-28 shows you how it is that you have an increase in blur on the cathode end of the x-ray tube as opposed to anode end of the x-ray tube. So the intensity is greater at the cathode end of the x-ray tube, which is, I guess, good in a way. You get a, an increase in output on the cathode end of the x-ray tube, but the sharpness is greater on the anode end of the x-ray tube. So if you just think of it this way, you get an increase in sharpness. Uh, well, let's think of it the other way. You get an increase in penumbra. So you get an increase in blur, and you get an increase in intensity on the cathode end of the x-ray tube. I'm going to delete this, and I'm going to put those page numbers in here. So stand by. So to kind of review, oh, I'll put them back in there. There you go. Page numbers 115, 114, 177. There are a lot of other things you can glean there too. Um, the issue with the spherical shaped object on an angulation you can see on page 176. The uh, difference in angulation with an uh, object that's shaped differently you see also in figure 10-24. You see foreshortening in figure 10-25. You see elongation in 10-26 and 10-27 as well. So in the anode heel effect, just to recap, what we have is a greater intensity at the cathode end of the x-ray tube, which gives us an increase in density or exposure on the cathode end of the x-ray tube. And it occurs because of the filtration effects on the anode, which decreases the intensity proportionally on the anode end of the x-ray tube. It's less significant at increased SIDs because, again, if you look on page 170, any of them really, um, what you're, actually let's go all the way back to 155 for 115. If you back up your OID or your SID, then what you're going to be using, because you're going to collimate down, is a more vertical portion of that x-ray beam. So instead of using from 75 all the way up to 120% of your intensity, you might just be selecting from 95 to 105%. So the percentage-wise difference between 95 and 105% is, is pretty insignificant as opposed to 75 to 120 is pretty significant. So the anode heel effect, the effects of the anode heel effect are less at increased SIDs. Again, you've got a sharper image on the anode end of the x-ray tube, uh, but most of the time we're not that interested in, in the difference in sharpness. How we have used the anode heel effect to our benefit is if we have anatomy that is greatly different in tissue thickness. So we're going to put the thickest anatomy on the cathode end of the x-ray tube in order to utilize that to our benefit. So anatomy that's shaped like a wedge, you would put the thicker end of the anatomy, like the foot let's say, you put the thicker end of the anatomy under the cathode end of the x-ray tube. You put the thin end, end of the anatomy under the anode into the x-ray tube. If you're taking an x-ray of the um, T-spine, you'd put the, the upper end of the T-spine, the lower portion of the C-spine under the anode into the x-ray tube, and the lower portion of the T-spine under the cathode into the x-ray tube. Most of your rooms are set up to take advantage of the anode heel effect, but if you're taking exams tabletop, then you you may have to consider that whenever you're loading the patient onto the table. Or if you're shooting portable, T-spine or feet, 